The Pathfinder is a Native American equinox site in Colorado being introduced now for the first time. Its array of pecked petroglyphs apparently weaves together a story about birth, death, and the afterlife. Two massive rock slabs lean inward to form a tall and narrow tent-like shelter. A large prominent leaf image appears on the northwest wall. The opposing rock wall casts a matching shadow that fills the leaf only at equinox dawn. The rock edge might have broken to create a slight jagged gap in the present shadow. At the peak of this cap rock structure, a natural chimney opens the steep panel to midday light. Here, during high noon on the equinoxes, the mythological storyboard is sliced by a sun ray. But before the main sun ray is formed, a scalpel-like spotlight appears, then quickly fades away. Our sun ray begins as a needle of light, comparable in length and dimension to Fahada Butte's famous sun daggers. However, ours grows much longer. With archaeoastronomical alignments, the longer the throw, the more precise the targeting potential. A carved snake shown in green will eventually be struck, but only after an elaborate petroglyph near the center is pierced. Highlighted in yellow, its sexual content will be described shortly. Our time compression is slowed to carefully document the equinox sunray as it crosses a prominent natural division on the rock face. The sexually explicit petroglyph appears to diagram mated sex organs and a second phallus to the right. This could depict the Navajo legend of changing woman impregnated with twins by the blinding noonday sun. The human form whose abdomen is pricked by the advancing solar tip could be changing woman, who also symbolized the seasonal cycles and was a metaphor for aging and renewal. This event occurred about 24 hours after the actual moment of the fall equinox when thick clouds obscured the sun. With the sun now south of the equator, the path of the sun rays tip is slightly above where it would have been the day before. This sequence was taken a half a day after the spring equinox of 2004, when the sun was slightly north of the equator. Thus, the advancing sun ray passed below where it would have traveled on a true noon equinox. These lit pathways define a narrow corridor for where the sun straddled either side of the equator. When equinox corresponds to the middle of the day and it's clear overhead, the sun rays tip sails down the middle of this lane. They were communicating. They were communicating with themselves. See, we think in terms of language, we think in terms of pictures. We have this right, right brain, left brain complex. We have two types of mentality, the holographic and the logical. The, 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 the kind of thinking that doesn't know anything about time or sequence, the kind that does. Roland Gillespie has played important roles in the U.S. space program as a designer of the rockets that sent men to the moon and as developer of the mathematical formula used to get them there. I invented the equation by which every rocket that's ever flown to the moon or to one of the planets, Russian, American, every single flight has been done with that equation. I didn't do it without some help. I had a couple of the best mathematicians in the, in the world for, the, for that subject helping me. Now, when I retired, I had this background. I had some uh, questions in uh, solar system astronomy and sort of an interest in the origins of our culture and of mankind himself. But in any field of uh, knowledge or learning, if you come up with some innovative concept or, or philosophy or discovery or invention that is radically different from, from the accepted, understood viewpoint, uh, even an invention that's going to throw people out of work, or a new political philosophy. It doesn't matter what it is, a strange religion. A people will resist it for one reason. It forces them to, to uh, reject their, their own beliefs, their fixed beliefs. Never mind whether the beliefs are well-founded or not, this is a, there's a psychological inertia that, that is universal in all of us, including those of us who come up with these new ideas. If it does require a an overturn of accepted beliefs, then uh, it will not be accepted. And not only that, but they're likely to burn you at the stake. Has American science failed to adequately consider evidence for a pre-Columbian Indo-European presence here? Yes, says Dr. Barry Fell. 
It's only a group of American archaeologists who have suffered from the peculiar manner in which archaeologists are educated in this country, totally omitting any knowledge of ancient languages, whatever, so that they can't recognize them when they see them. It's only them that are the uh, real problem. As a result of certain misguided efforts by, uh, by some people that drew Mr. Fell and his uh, cult following into uh, this, uh, uh, this field, uh, certain letters, letters went out trying to resolve the issue. Dr. Calvin Watkins, who is uh, in the Department of Linguistics at Harvard University, uh, his opening statement is, I have examined the photographs of Colorado petroglyphs at 5LA-115, which you sent me on September 1. I can state categorically that they are not a variant of Ogam a la Barry Fell, as you put it in your letter. Then he goes on in some detail explaining what real Ogam looks like. Interestingly, true Ogam is written vertically, not horizontally, only horizontally in very, very rare cases. If you will look at his fine example of Ogham, in which he, uh, you have so strongly relied upon, and then you compare it to a respectable example of Ogham, you'll find that he doesn't even have the correct number of strokes for the letter D. And I see. so that and much your expert that. can't even write Ogham himself. I see. And then he goes and that's on. Why he, that's why he is the linguist at Harvard and you are not. Your other expert that says there's no Ogham outside the British Isles, is absolutely incorrect. There is some in Europe, in Africa, in North and South America. It exists, and it is Ogham. This article ran in the student newspaper the day the University of Colorado's Cultural Events Board convened a discussion of the discoveries. Academic voices objected. It's not supported by any kind of scientific evidence. Yet science and rigorous evaluation are at work. The rock art dating, the archaeoastronomy, epigraphy, and linguistics do matter. By suggesting natives may not be responsible for all ancient rock inscriptions in Colorado, Ogham researchers were accused of politicizing the issue. There are no professional archaeologists who would take this claim seriously. Colorado's Ogham controversy began with these grooves discovered in 1975. They were found by Dr. Don Rickey chief historian for the Bureau of Land Management while hiking near the site of an 1868 Indian battle which killed an ancestor in the U.S. cavalry. Having read Barry Fell's America B.C., Ricky felt these marks resembled Ogham in Scotland, but archaeologists soon conspired to derail Ricky's excitement and squash any connection to the old world. National Park Service archaeologist Wilfred Logan wrote to University of Edinburgh professor Stuart Piggott in the hunt for such an authority. Pickett suggested colleague Kenneth Jackson, with the warning, any reply he may vouchsafe will be explosive, and the footnote, I've just seen him, and I'm right. In appealing to Dr. Jackson's sensitivities, Dr. Logan then confessed his concerns if the sensationalized claims concerning certain grooves in the sandstone cliffs go unrefuted, and if further publicity appears in the popular press. Regarding Barry Fell and other advocates of Ogham in America, Jackson said, their theories are of course totally untenable, and in your own word, preposterous. And I have written every time to tell them so, but without effect it seems. Jackson ended his letter suggesting Logan also contact Harvard professor Calvert Watkins for further ammunition. Logan apparently passed along Jackson's critique and Watkins' name to fellow skeptic and Colorado State archaeologist Dr. Bruce Ripito. A staffer then solicited written remarks from both men. State archaeologist Ripito joined a July 1977 site survey and rejected the theory that this is Ogham's script. Nonetheless, the site was nominated to the National Register of Historic Places, assuming Native Americans did the carving. These presumptions hold even today, although much clearer examples of translated Ogham verified by archaeoastronomy have been found nearby, such as in Crack Cave. The Denver Post reported in September 2005, these are carvings Plains Indians created maybe 700 years ago to mark the equinoxes. The Post reporter later told us a Forest Service archaeologist told her that studies had concluded this. But when asked to see them, Comanche National Grasslands District Forest Service Ranger Thomas Peters said no such studies existed. Seems archaeologists consider preservation a sacred trust, especially when it comes to preserving their own dogma.